I think we're gonna get started. Um, so yeah, thanks for our five audience members for coming to this. Um, I wanted to start off by saying the last time we did this, we ended up, yeah, basically two of our panelists are people that attended this last Fulbright information session in 2019. So by attending, you're already on your way to getting a Fulbright, so thanks for coming. Um, and those of you that don't know, so Milliken was named one of the top 10 producers of Fulbright um, U.S. Scholars for bachelor's institutions in 2021-2022. And so each year, um, the U.S. Department of State announces the top producing institutions. And um, two scholars who are here today, and Tony, <laughs> were um, our Fulbright awardees for 2021 and 2022. And we had, um, we received that award and we had more Fulbright than any other bachelor's institution in Illinois, which I think is great, so. Um, so yeah, so I'll introduce our panelists and then uh, I have a little bit of a PowerPoint with some information and then we will launch into the discussion question. So I'm uh, Dr. Laura Dean, I'm Associate Professor of Political Science here at Milliken. Um, I have had a Fulbright, two Fulbrights to Latvia. I just keep going to the same country. Um, so our panelists today at the end is Dr. Tony McGagna. He's an Associate Professor of English at Milliken. He's received two Fulbright um, scholars to Tohoku University, Tohoku um, University in Sendai, and Kyoto University of Foreign Studies in Kyoto, Japan, in 2018, 2019. And then he was a Fulbright Junior Lecturer. Le he received a Fulbright Junior Lectureship in American Studies at the University of Potsdam, Germany, during the 2012-2013 academic year. Um, next to Dr. Megagna is uh, Dr. Mark Tonelli. He's an Associate Professor of Music at Millikan University. He was a visiting professor at Universidade Federal de Uberlandia. Is that right? Okay. Um, in Uberlandia, Minas uh, Gerais. Is that right? Um, in uh, Brazil, where he taught courses in jazz ensemble, jazz guitar, and music entrepreneurship, and conducted research into the arts and political movement of Club da Esquina. Esquina? Esquina? Esquina. Um, and then to my right is Dr. Morella Tenta. She's an Associate Professor of Art History at Milliken. She was a research and teaching Fulbright Scholar at the National University of Arts in Bucharest from 2021 to 2022. She taught classes on gender and art and arts discourse and conducted research on contemporary artistic practices and women's reproductive rights in Romania. So welcome to our panelists. Welcome to our esteemed audience. Um, I'm just gonna quickly go through a few things about Fulbright. Um, I've given uh, all of our audience members the brochures that Fulbright gives us, but basically the idea of Fulbright. Um, so it's a program, it is the longest running and probably most prestigious exchange program that we have in the United States. It was started by William Fulbright um, in 1946. Um, and it's basically a U.S. Department of State program with the aim to foster mutual understanding between nations, advance knowledge across communities, and improve lives around the world. And the Fulbrights are available for a variety of disciplines, as I think you can see from this audience, right? Political science, art history, music, and English. Um, and also there's an increased emphasis on STEM. Um, so basically almost any discipline you can get a Fulbright for. Um, Fulbrights by the number, so they give over 8,000 awards annually. Um, and Milliken, I think, has been very successful in getting them. So all of us, I mean, it was my first time applying. You got it your first time applying. You received numerous. Got it the first time you applied, Tony, first time? Yes, so basically, if you apply, the odds are pretty good that you will get one. So I hope that you consider applying. And we'll talk to our panelists kind of about how they chose the country that they wanted to go to as well. Um, so yeah, so you can get awards throughout your career. So all of us are associate professors. I had mine as an assistant professor. I think Tony, you had yours also as an assistant professor. You were an associate by the time you went, and same with you, Mark, right? Or you went up for tenure and then went on your full brain. Okay. So yeah, so both junior and tenured faculty um, can get it. Also postdocs. Um, you can get, so there are different options, and all of us had academic semester or year fellowships, but they just started a summer one. So you can actually go for numerous summers. So 
if Milliken doesn't give you leave, you can apply to go for two or three summers and they'll fly you each summer and give you a stipend for each summer. And a lot of um, people, so I had a colleague actually do this to Brazil this summer, he had small kids and so he couldn't go during the academic year and he is going two summers um, in a row to be able to go and they pay for his flight and airfare and everything. So if the semester option is too long for you, there are options for shorter programs and then there's also options for administrator programs, which are three weeks long. So if a semester is too long for you, you can always go for a shorter amount of time. Um, and then there are multi-country awards. So all of us went to one country. Tony went to two different universities in one country, um, but you can also apply for multiple countries. So if you want to, you know, kind of diversify your research project and go and teach and do research in different countries, you're able to do that too. Um, okay, so there's a whole bunch of different grants. Um, the Distinguished Chair Awards, I believe, are more money, but basically there's a wide variety of them. The flexed ones are the ones that I was talking about with the summer, and then you can do teaching, research, or teaching and research. And I think we'll kind of talk about that um, as we go, um, because we've also, amongst us, have had a variety of different teaching and research um, fellowships. And we'll talk about the difference between those later. Um, so yeah, one thing, so US citizenship, so they say it's required, but then you can email them and ask about it. So uh, you don't necessarily, <laughs> this is on video, um, you can email them and talk to them about it. But yeah, they do have options, especially if you teach in the United States and you're not a US citizen. Um, you can email them to see if you meet eligibility requirements. Um, you, yeah, so they say you need a terminal degree, so PhD um, may be required, but it really depends on the award and the country that you want to go to, and also how competitive those awards are. So it's like really difficult to get a Fulbright to the UK unless you're doing STEM. Um, but you know, many other countries, the you know, uh, competition is not as fierce. So, um, so yeah. So we see there's a variety of different options. Um, they used to have a limit. You could only get what I think it was two Fulbrights in your academic career, but then fewer people applied because people take multiple Fulbrights, and so they changed that so you can get as many as you want, but I think the rule is you have to wait five years. Five years to apply six years in between. So you can go every six years for the rest of your life to a different country if you would like. Um, so this just looks at, so basically the way I did it is, you know, I identified the country I was interested in, it's clearly Latvia, and then I looked to see what awards were available there. So you can think about, are you interested in going to a specific country, or think about, are you interested in going, um, you know, to teach STEM somewhere? So you can narrow it down by country or by discipline um, with the awards, because some countries have specific disciplinary awards, which I think um, Tony will talk about. Um, maybe with his junior lectureship in American studies, that's really just for American studies. Um, and so, yeah, so it depends on kind of the country and what types of disciplines they prefer because some, like in Latvia, there's always a lawyer that gets it because they have them teach at the University of Latvia and the law faculty. Um, so yeah, so it kind of depends. So think about what country or whatever discipline you're interested in. Um, and then these are just some understanding of the awards. Um, yeah, so the deadline is September 15th every single year. Um, so just FYI, if you're thinking and you apply September 15th and then you would apply to go the next year. So you actually end up waiting a long time. Um, I had an interview for mine. I don't know if any of you interviewed for yours, no one else? Oh well, okay. Yeah, and my interview was partially in Latvian, I think, because they wanted to make sure I could actually speak the language. So, um, so yeah, so you, you basically submit your application September 15th and then you kind of wait. Um, when did you guys hear? March? April? They, that's new I mean, that, they've okay. given more time for the application now. It used to be August 1st. Okay. So I would apply by August 1st. I got notification that I had been passed on to the country uh, around Thanksgiving time. Yeah. And then I didn't hear for firm word until February. Okay. So yeah, so basically you find, so you apply in September now, you figure out if you make it past the US peer review in um, October, November, um, and then, yeah, I'd see, yeah, I mean that, oh yeah, so then it does say applicant notice, notice of status um, November, January. So yeah, it's widely, it's different in every single country. 
Um, there are forums that you can go on to find out if other people heard, which I think is kind of weird. So, um, but if you're interested, but yeah, basically, and then sometimes some countries have an interview process, um, and then they'll tell you, yeah, it says January to April, but yeah, I mean, I know people that have found out, especially with the pandemic, much later than that. Um, okay, yeah, and then those are different things that we've gotten, so. So yeah, so that's kind of my brief introduction. Um, just FYI, so I mean, like, I were, I'm always willing to read things. I know Tony has read a lot of people's um, essays as well. Um, I'm also willing to send you my application. So if you're interested in kind of seeing successful applications, just send me an email, Laura Dean, L. Dean at Milliken. Um, and yeah, I mean, the other panelists I'm sure would be willing, so just ask us and we're happy to read and edit anything um, that you do because we want other faculty to be successful because at least for me, and hopefully you'll hear more about this today, that it is really a transformative experience. It's great to get out of Millican and go teach in other places and interact with other students, so. Okay, so I'm gonna start off with a question to my colleagues. So what is your favorite memory from your Fulbright experience? I don't know who wants to start. Mark, you were just there, so maybe you want, your the memories are fresher in your mind. <laughs> sent us some of these questions ahead of time and I tried to think what was my favorite memory of living in Brazil for five months. It's really hard to narrow down to just one thing I love. Uh, so I don't know that I have a favorite memory, but I have some memories that are really special. Um, I guess some surprise things that, that probably shouldn't have been surprises. When you, when you do a Fulbright or when you go to visit another country, you often think about, oh, I can't wait to taste the food and the, the weather and go see the sights. But the thing that really I loved most about my Fulbright was the people. The Brazilian people were so warm. And they were really interested in Americans. Uh, they were interested in, in our culture. They asked a lot of questions. When I interacted with my students, they, you know, they wanted to know what was life like here in the U.S.? You know, where did I live? What was life like for a professor, for a musician, a jazz musician? What, you know, what did gigs pay? Uh, what kind of recordings, you know, that would I listen to? And so it was this constant exchange with the people. And you know, by the time I left, I had really gotten to know my students and a lot of other you know, colleagues and other people that I interacted with. You know, they came up to me and would hug me and like, you know, a little piece of my heart. You know, would go with them when, it, when I would have to say goodbye for the last time. So I guess for me, it was just being immersed in a different culture and just feeling the warmth and the beauty of the people who were so receptive to us. I, I don't know that every country is quite as warm, but I, I have a feeling that it's probably a similar experience for most Fulbrighters, that they feel embraced by the people that uh, of the country that they went to. And they, they probably come home with those memories. So I guess if there's a favorite memory for me, it's just the people. Um, I really you know, grew to love them. It was very easy to love them. But you know, I think about my students, and I still stay in touch with them. I follow them on Instagram, vice versa. And we have our WhatsApp groups. I have you know, 50 to 100 different WhatsApp groups on my phone. And that's one way I stay in touch with my students. Just uh, some of my students are playing a band together. They just released a CD and they sent me, you know, hey, check out our new CD. And I'm seeing it pop up on Instagram and I'm liking it and they're liking my video. So, you know, technology really makes it easy to stay in touch with. And so 30 years ago, it would be what? Like very expensive phone calls and, and letters and things like that. And so uh, it's one way to extend the program. So for me, it was just the people. of you know the personal the professional and the teaching right and especially all three of us taught while we were there and that's not always a part of your role right but um that's one of my favorite parts but you know personally right it's it's the experience because i both of mine were year long so i had a lot of time to immerse myself and travel and the first time i went my wife was with me the 
the last time I went, I was on my own most of the time. Uh, but the experience and, you know, didn't have a lot of resources, pulled back, it's not particularly lucrative, right? But my wife and I, especially, I go back to when we were in Germany, made the choice of, okay, we can either, you know, expend some of our limited resources and travel now, or if we ever wanted to return to these places later and we're living in the US, it's gonna be, you know, 10 times as expensive. And so really taking advantage of that and being able to travel and being able to host people as well. Um, Actually, when I was in Kyoto, Carrie came and we had we had uh, dinner together, and um, my sister came while I was there, and, and things like that. On the professional side, um, I did more of this in Germany than I did in Japan, but I did it both places. Is um, being there on a year, and in Germany, it was part of what my position was was um, public lectures, right? Being invited to different universities around the country, and uh, the local Fulbright Commission paid for me to go to these places but just the experience professionally of, of being the main attraction, right? And being able to develop topics and share topics where there really was a, a, a sort of avid audience, right? The people who came were really interested in, in me and what I had to say and what I had to, to contribute. And I felt like, you know, that's a rare experience. You know, we go to conferences and talk and stuff like that, and that's like a captive audience. But the idea of being you know, there and being the attraction that people wanted to listen to what I had to share and what I had to say. So professionally, that was really enriching. Uh, and I have very fond memories of that, particularly in Germany. And then the teaching is, is the same thing that Mark said, right? Getting to know students. This is also, as somebody who's made my career here at Millican, um, you know, to teach graduate level students, right? In, in both places, I taught graduate classes. To work with people one-on-one -on -one and to see where they go, right? I had a, a, a history student, actually, in Japan who uh, was doing his dissertation in African-American history sort of comparing Japanese reparations movement to African American reparations movement in the United States, but he'd never been to the United States. And I helped him put together a proposal for his first conference in Washington, D.C., and it got delayed because of COVID, but eventually he was able to go. And same thing, following him on, on social media and, and recognizing that and realizing that I put a role in that. You know, those kinds of connections, I think, are, are really, really great. Um, and there is a sense of and it cuts both ways sometimes, but uh, the students who are there, the classes I taught, you know, they were particularly interested because I was offering them subject matter that they weren't getting otherwise. And then there's also the attraction of, of being the, the local American, right? And I think if you didn't really use that, it cuts both ways, like I said. Um, but that for me was really, um, on the teaching side, very common. Well, I think that for me, um, it was, as you said, the people. Um, but it's very interesting that I made, um, um, it was so nice to share the time and experience of food and gathering and thinking about a research project and architecture and walking with other Fulbrighters coming to town. So it's very interesting how suddenly uh, you, you share commonalities, although we don't really know anything about each other. So I stayed for a, for a year, um, so I had time to, um, you know, to develop you know, relationship professionally and personally, and but I probably my favorite favorite thing was um, being able to share everything with my family there, from food and streets and re research, right? They're taking them to conferences, and you know, it probably happened to all of you when you travel somewhere by yourself and you see something extraordinary, and it's like half of you is enjoying, and half is like, oh. They would love to see this. Oh, they would have loved to taste this food or this ice cream. Or oh, they would have loved this view. And I just got to actually do that with the family, so I didn't have that feeling of traveling on my own to conferences and study abroad. And so I think that was my favorite thing. I I, I could finally fully focus on my experience there, so I didn't have to compromise, compartmentalize. Yes. Okay, so how did you become interested in applying for a Fulbright? Um, so a long time ago, um, I met a Fulbright, American Fulbrighter in uh, Iași, northern Romania, where I was teaching philosophy. And um, she came there because we met in the United States previously. And she said, if I ever apply with the Fulbright, I'm going to come in whatever city you are. So that's where I was. 
So she spent her year, uh, she is a writer, she published actually um, a collection of short stories based on her, res her research on Fulbright that year, and we are still very good friends. So um, then I came to the United States, and I, it always was somewhere in my head, and then my husband, um, 10 years ago, um, had a Fulbright. So I said, you know, when I, when I really find something that I really truly want to do, that will be a Fulbright. And so somehow I feel like I was always ready somehow for it, but I never really find, found that project that I have to move mountains to get there, <laughs> to finish it, because that's how it felt. <laughs> put together the application, to continue to teach, to put together tenure <laughs> application, kids, and so on. So once I knew what I wanted to do, then it just, it just everything moved from there. Question is, oh, how, how did I find out I'm here? Who was coming to this presentation a few years ago, which was upstairs in the Center for International Education? Uh, three years. It was. Yeah, it was like October 2019. Yeah, yeah. Tony had just gotten back, and I had been studying Portuguese for a few months at that point, and I thought. Hmm. Fulbright sends people to other parts of the world, and they pay for it. I've always wanted to go to Brazil. Maybe I'll go to this presentation and see what it's all about. And of course, I'm glad I did, because here I am sitting at, at, on the panel table now. Uh, and really, it was very much because of Laura and, and Tony's encouragement. I mean, I knew what Fulbright was, but I thought, oh, that's only for like, super smart people, <laughs> super accomplished people. And um, I, I'm, I'm never going to get uh, selected for an award like that. So, um, I came and then I, you know, of course, COVID came in between. So like that was October 2019, and then, and by March 2020, kind of um, threw a wrench in everybody's plans, of course. But but I applied anyway. I applied that summer. I applied by September 20, uh, 2020, which was good practice actually because the following year. I uh, applied for tenure, and it took me three months to complete my Fulbright application, and it took me three months to complete my tenure application. So, you know, the Fulbright's good training <laughs> for, for tenure and promotion because many of the requirements are similar. It was, I, I couldn't have copied and pasted necessarily, but they asked for a lot of similar, similar documents and, and background information. That took a long time to compile. So anyway, that's how I got interested in coming to this presentation. And, and then, uh, I, you know, I, I think Tony really helped a lot along the way with um, editing my materials and um, not editing, really giving me, giving me feedback, you know. Some of it was really key feedback. Like I remember one, I know this isn't a question you asked, Laura, but I'm going to go ahead and <laughs> okay. talk about it anyway be, before I forget. Um, I was almost finished with it, and I had, by the way, I asked a lot of different people to read my Fulbright application. Not the whole thing, but, you know, the, the, like an essay, a five-page essay that's really kind of the, the nucleus of the whole package. I think I sent that to about a half a dozen people, including uh, some former Fulbrighters. And I was just about to send it off, and I had some kind of line in, some line in there about, you know, I, I can't wait to go to Brazil to see, feel the tropical breeze and put my toes in the sand or something like that, which is ironic because we lived nine, nine hours <laughs> in the beach. <laughs> Uh, and, and, you know, Tony looked at it, he said, this is great, he said, but you be careful that you don't wind up um, stereotyping or, or coming across as stereotyping the place that you're going to. Uh, I thought that was a really great comment. It could have tanked my chances. So I, I guess I'm just speaking to the, the value of sending your materials around. So once you find out about Fulbright, you meet other Fulbrighters, and then you, you share with them your ideas for going, your project, and you get good feedback from them because they've already had this experience and they can sort of help you navigate some things that could be construed negatively you know, from the different communities. So, anyway. Just in case it scares people, Mark worked extra hard on his application. It doesn't always take three months, but he, he really, really put a lot into it. Um, but for me, um, when I was in graduate school, I had uh, a mentor, and at that time, and even when I went on my first Fulbright, the rule was still in place that two of you're done, right? Two Fulbrights in a lifetime. Um, so uh, 
Dave Jervis, who was here when I got here, uh, had his second Fulbright when I first arrived here, and I remember him telling me vividly, right, like the heartbreak when he got on the plane to come back, knowing that that was it, right? He was never going to be able to do it again. Subsequently, he's now teaching for real permanently in Poland. But um, my mentor in graduate school had had two, including one in the 80s to the Soviet Union at that time. And he always spoke very highly of the experience and kind of put it in my mind. And then my, my wife, uh, actually, when we first started dating, uh, we dated for a year and then she went abroad to Germany on a full bite. She was a student at ETA, an English teaching assistant. And I was able to go and visit her and see that side of things. So it was always stuck in my head that that's something that I wanted to do. And then when I got here, it really did become a matter of, especially for me, somebody who's special in the in American studies, right? It's very hard to make a case for a research program because why would I go to another country to study American studies? It can be done, and you can you can you know make a case for it. But it was much easier for me when I discovered the teaching aspect of Fulbright and the lectureships capacity to be able to make a case for well, I can come to your country. These are the things I can offer while I'm in your country, rather than just the things that I take away from it. Um, and so putting together my first application to go, um, it was really inspired by you know sort of learning about it when I was in graduate school and wanting to pursue it. But I did, I felt like uh, there was no way I was ever going to get it, especially not on my first try. Um, and I think I spent a lot of time thinking about how to make a case for the fact that it ended up being successful. But I just, I felt like, I want to give this a shot. It's something I really want to do eventually. But there's no way, I was in my third year teaching, I was an assistant professor. There's no way I'm going to get it my first try and I ended up getting it. Um, but it was just something I wanted to pursue. And and I think that's an important point too. So like I, you know, I'm an international politics person. I study Eastern Europe, right? Um, but Fulbright doesn't actually want people like me. In fact, like 75% of the people that go are people who have never lived in or gone to the country. Um, and I think that's kind of a misconception that many people are like, oh, I don't do international things. Why would I go and teach abroad? They want people to teach American studies. They want people to teach American government or you know anything about the United States. You know, Latvia doesn't need another Latvian politics expert. There's only two million people in that country, so. Um, so anyway, so yeah, so I think that's important to note that like, yeah, I, as a international specialist, they actually prefer people who study the United States um, to go and teach about the United States because the purpose is to build, you know, a cultural understanding and so. Um, so yeah, okay, so my next question is, why did you choose the country that you did? I can, I can start with, with this one and I, I will say building off of that, it works it, completely inadvertently, I ended, I've ended up going to the two keystone countries of the original Fulbright charge. Mm -hmm. um, and it's important to keep that in mind with Fulbright. Like, just as Laura said, um, everything in Fulbright is driven by the mission, right? And the mission goes all the way back to the late 40s about rebuilding these connections and building global understanding and intercultural exchange. And so it's something that you know I've talked about with people who've applied, right? Really understanding and putting that mission at the core of your application materials. And again, I've inadvertently, right, because Fulbright, the senator, built the program to try and rebuild relationships between Germany and Japan and the Western world after World War II, and then I inadvertently end up going to both Germany and Japan for my Fulbrights. Um, but when I went and I chose Germany for my first one, um, part of that was driven by, that was the language that I had, right? And um, also looking at what the opportunities were for my particular area, which is uh, the literature and culture of the American West. Um, was something that was really appealing to Germany because there's a long history there of uh, romanticizing the American West and I was able to make an um, application to sort of speak to, well, I can come and enter into that conversation and also expand upon it and you know, show the students the contemporary side of the American West and the realities of the American West. Um, and so I built my case around that. And so it was partly driven by, I'm interested in Germany, I speak German, and there's opportunities there. Um, when I chose to go to Japan, I started first, having had that experience with, where's another place where I can make a similar case? And I had no particular interest in Japan. I mean, I'm, I'm glad I went, but I, I wasn't like a, a Japanophile or anything like that. Um, it was just another place where here's another culture, partially for the same reasons, has a, a long history of sort of the American West and romanticizing the American West in Japanese culture. And I, I made a case around that for coming to teach there. 
And so there I started with, I want another Fulbright, where's a place where I could be successful in my application? And it ended up being Japan. So two different reasons for two different places. Just to add something to the discussion about bringing American things, uh, as I prepare to answer the current question about why did I choose Brazil, my, my area of specialty as a musician is jazz, and jazz is often what we think of as a uniquely American art form. So I was bringing that to Brazil. Of course they played jazz there, and they had Brazilian jazz, and um, there were lots of people playing jazz, but they don't have very many Americans, period, in Brazil. Uh, and then you, know, you go down you know, further levels, not many Americans playing music, and then not many Americans playing jazz. So I was really a population of one in the city that, that I lived in, and there were no other Americans um, in the city of 750,000 that I lived in playing music, and then never mind jazz. And there weren't many Americans, period. There couldn't have been more than 15 or 20. And three of them were Fulbrighters, me and two, two ETAs that were at the university. So it was a very small percentage of Americans. So bringing something like jazz to Brazil uh, from, America, from an American, who plays it was really, that was seen as something um, valuable, unique, um, exotic, I suppose, at the same time. But so they really, they were like, wow, we've got this American guy here who plays jazz, and we're interested in jazz. You know, what a, what a great opportunity we have. And so I think, I think that they, they felt that way about it. And so I think that is a, a unique thing to highlight, is that um, bringing American things to other countries is, is a good point of departure. It's a good idea. It doesn't have to be. Of course, you don't have to go there and teach American things necessarily, but that is part of the experience, right? And so if you have a uniquely American point of view or a subject that you teach, that you know that, that can be valuable. And so why I, why I chose Brazil is I had, had been in love with the country since I was, for most of my adult life. As a jazz musician, we learn a lot of Brazilian jazz songs. And I just sort of fell in love with um, the music, and then eventually the language and the culture, and I had always wanted to go for me. You know, for 30 years, I had wanted to go, and so I think that's important because I had a passion for it. Um, I, you know, I didn't like spin the globe and just put my finger on wherever, you know, wherever, wherever it stopped, and then I decided to go there. I don't think that approach necessarily works because then you have to sort of reverse engineer your reason for going, and it can come through as you know, it's fraudulent, I guess. Uh, people can see right through that. So it was, you know, I didn't know, a lot of people said, you know, and you need to speak to why you should be chosen for this award and not why, not somebody else, why you are uniquely qualified for this award. I didn't know how to say that other than, I don't know how much more qualified it can be than I, I can't wait to put my feet on Brazilian soil. I've been thinking about this place for 30 years. I've studied the language, I've studied the music. I've played in Brazilian ensembles. I've written Brazilian music. I mean, I love this place. What more reason can, can there be than that? And you do have to obviously come up with uh, a more compelling reason than that you simply want to go and you love it. You have to have a project and you have to very succinctly explain what your project is going to be and how you're going to accomplish it. But having, you know, having some background, some relationship with the country, uh, some you know, personal reason is a good place to start. And I think you can infuse your application materials with that passion. If you don't have a passion, if you just sort of don't really have a, a you know, a, a great reason for going, I, I think that your application can be easily passed over for somebody who really does, you know, have a compelling reason for wanting to go. So it was easy for me to speak to that in my application materials. It was hard to whittle it down to five pages, but I was able to really imbue, I think, my application with the, the passion I felt for, for the country. Um. So I was born in Romania. So then when I was thinking about applying for a Fulbright to Romania, the advice, I remember I was at the CA conference uh, 10, 15 years ago um, in New York and I went to a Fulbright representative, right? And I said, you know, this is my project. I'm thinking about this. What do you think? No way, don't waste your time. You're born in Romania, but I'm an American citizen. And you know, I, I, I think it's a plus that I speak the language. I know the culture. I can do research that maybe some an American cannot do. and. I, so I was discouraged. I, I 
put it aside and then when you look at the Fulbright application, one of the questions, if you remember, is why the place that you're applied? In my case, the question became, why Romania? So I realized that my project is so embedded in the fact that I am from Romania, that otherwise the project would not exist, that that was my argument. What happened with women reproductive rights 30 years after the Romanian Revolution, and how is that, this is the project, I can't, turn it into something that is not. So the answer became easy, right, in a way. I am going there because I need to be there to see that. So it's, it's, it's very interesting that it can work in so many ways. So if the project has, I feel like if the project is really a passion, or maybe in my case, my friends would make fun of me. It's like, really, you're putting all this work to go to Romania to talk to all the people that everybody wants to avoid on this subject. I don't think this subject will be an easy subject. Are you sure you want to spend a year knocking on doors and talking about women reproductive rights in Romania in 2022? This is what I want to do. So it, it, it shows in the application and it's, it flows in a way. If you find something that this is it, you see the beginning and the end um, and you're serious about it, it shows. Okay, so can you talk about what you did on your Fulbright? So we've heard about a variety of like re research and teaching, so talk about kind of what you did and the classes that you taught. And we only have about 15 minutes left, so um, then we'll open it up for questions from the audience after you guys answer this one. So uh, our audience members be preparing your questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll jump, jump in on that one. Uh, I, I had a, what was called the All, All Disciplines Award for Brazil. It did require a doctorate, required six years of teaching, something like that. Um, you had to, when I applied, you couldn't be, you had to be a senior, senior professor. I wasn't a senior professor, but you had to be considered mid, oh, that was what it was, mid-career. You had to be mid-career. They changed that. Uh, I don't think it has to be that way anymore. I think you can just apply at any stage in your career. And the award specified teaching and research. And you could, as the applicant, decide what proportion of teaching and research you would do. Um, I selected 75% teaching, 25% research. So I taught four courses. I taught two music ensembles. I taught applied private electric guitar lessons. And I also taught a jazz improvisation. Those were my official teaching duties at the university. My reads, and I saw so it was, you know, it was quite a quite a bit of work actually. Um, but you know, it was great. The research part, at least for a performer, um, for me, I, I wanted to investigate this musical movement called Kubi Da Skin. Actually, they're celebrating their 50th year right now. It was kind of a big deal that I was there at that time, and the musical movement was born in a in the region of Brazil where I was, and I had colleagues who had done dissertations on this movement, and so I just, I don't, I don't think I got lucky. I think by design, um, people in that region are interested in that movement because it's local, it's part of their heritage. And, and I selected that movement specifically because it was something that was part of that region, and I wanted to investigate it, and, I, and it was a part of a style of Brazilian music I really not had not explored before. Um, so for me, researching it was learning the music, learning the repertoire that's part of that that um, that style of music, that 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 movement. Um, and so I would often get music that uh, colleagues or other students or other musicians on performances would share with me in, in advance of the performance, so I could learn it. I met with my colleague who had done his dissertation on on Kubidaiski, and I went to the city where the movement was born. I spent some time there visiting the sites uh, and also did some shows there, did some performances. And then I saw some of the musicians and met them who were part of this, this musical movement, who are kind of legends in Brazil. And I got to go see them perform, talk with them a little bit. So for me, that was more like field research, like being out among the people, among the musicians, absorbing the music, learning the music. And I traveled a lot throughout Brazil. I was based in one city, but I, I think I traveled either by car or mostly by plane to five or six other cities 
where I would either perform or also give some master classes or clinics at, a, at the local university. So I think I went to three or four other universities in addition to the one where I taught. Um, and I, we were there for 20 weeks. So, you know, my, my wife and children did it. My wife is sitting over there, and our, our three teenagers came with us as well. So the whole family was there for five months, which is a whole other, you know, other topic to talk about, like Marilla talked about, uh, being there with your family. Uh, and so um, that's what I did, you know, for those for those five months. Oh, so that's what I was going to say. We were there for 20 weeks, and I had 20 performances. So I was performing about once a week, either locally at the university in like a bar or some kind of venue in town, or off or in a jazz club or someplace else, you know, in the country. And so um, for me, that was part of my research. You know, in a way, was performing getting to know the music, and in most of the shows I played, or at least about half of them, um, the performers would say, hey, let's play something from Kui Dai Steam, and they would send it ahead of time. Or sometimes they would, you know, they would, they would put the music on the stand right there and say, let's try this piece. And I was always like, okay, great, let's, let's do it. I, I was, you know, um, I wanted to take that leap of faith and just kind of, uh, back to by fire, just go into, go into it and, and learn right on the spot. So I was all for anything that related to that style of music. So that's what I did. Taught, researched, traveled, um, ate a lot of delicious food, tried not to make a fool of myself in <laughs> restaurants and supermarkets and places where I couldn't understand what they were saying. I'll just be brief because I, I, I'd rather entertain the questions, but um, for me, again, because I had a, a full time pure teaching, right? So all of my work there was teaching. That doesn't mean I wasn't gathering material or working on my own projects, but uh, my purview, I guess, was largely teaching, and in all the institutions, and actually in Japan, it ended up being three institutions, because I had a second one uh, in Kyoto that I, I worked at, which is Nikkei University as well. Um, I taught some graduate level courses and some undergraduate level courses. Most of the courses I taught were in my specific area of expertise, but in all the cases, because I was the American on site, uh, I was also asked to teach like an American literature survey class and just sort of give an overview. So be able to roll with the punches. And then, like I said, more so in Germany than in Japan, part of my charge was uh, giving public lectures at other universities, similar to performances, to sort of bring my, my topics in, in areas to other universities around the country. And in Germany, yeah, I did over a dozen of that in the year that I was there. Um, and I did a little bit of that in Japan, but it was mostly for other full writers, because Japan has a very robust body of Japanese full writers who have come to the United States and gone back, and they have very strong organizations over there. Um, but yeah, most of my stuff was working uh, in classes and one-on-one -on -one with a lot of students and in both places, you know, working on uh, thesis projects with students and things like that. Um, I will just say something quick. Um, so it was 50-50 teaching research. My grant was specific. It was not all disciplines. It was specific, um, so I could uh, choose only 50-50. Right? That's how it was designed. Um, for humanities, for our history. Um, I taught two courses, and the rest was research. And the, the research was really embedded with the teaching. So when I selected the university, I selected it because um, National University of Arts in Bucharest, although it has an incredible history, uh, they never had in the, their catalog a course, Gender in Arts. So I thought, if I can get to teach this course there, and have it somewhere that students can research and look, uh, there is something called gender in art, that would be my achievement for, <laughs> for the rest of 10 years, right? Um, amazing colleagues, amazing students, uh, devoted to learning. I, it was really refreshing to me to, to experience it. Um, they have been teaching gender in art, but like small subjects here and there, like you'll put a week in your syllabus when you talk about this, and you put a week when you talk about that. So this was really, they were there because they wanted to know everything I had to say about and more. Um, and um, I embedded in the courses sites, so we went to archives, we went to museums, we talked to curators, we went to prison sites, we went to places that they pass by probably every day, but they didn't have any reason, or 
a green light to go inside, but because a Fulbright scholar, and this is something that it's truly amazing, opens so many doors to you, including the embassy, American embassy in the city. So you will get funds from them, you can put together conferences, you can say, I need a document from this place, but nobody can give it to me, can I? And then there will be a network that will start working. So there is, there is a chance to actually research something that you might not have an occasion to research, or sites for access that otherwise you will not have a chance to see as a Fulbrighter. So questions from our audience members? Otherwise I can ask them more questions, I just wanna. Do you have a question? Uh, does the Fulbright program uh, encourage having a language background for the country, or how do they, do they, are they neutral on that? Uh, it depends, it really does. Um, so one of the things I, I talked about with Mark when he was applying, I mean, he had it for Portuguese. Um, a lot of uh, Spanish-speaking countries, um, both, especially in, in the Western Hemisphere, but Spain to a certain degree too, uh, do encourage being able to teach in Spanish. Other countries, not so much. Like I went to Japan, and there, you know, I, there's no way I could have learned Jap Jap Japanese at any point in the compressed time that I had. So I, you know, I learned conversational stuff, but there was no requirement for that. I taught fully in English, and in Germany, even though I did have the language, um, I taught solely in, in English as well. And there were no requirements for that. But there are some Fulbrights in some countries that do require that. Similarly, there are some countries that require you to have a letter of invitation from a specific university. Both of my awards, because they were specific awards, uh, didn't require that. Uh, they wanted somebody in that position, and then they basically shopped me around to different universities who then accepted me. Uh, and so it varies, but the language it just depends on the country. Yeah, I mean, I was specifically told I had to teach in English, so, and I translated for students who, you know, didn't understand what I was saying some of the times and, like, would just translate my slides and things like that, but yeah, I mean, I was told specifically I had to teach my classes in English, so I think it also depends on the country, but yeah, you're there to, like, build mutual understanding between the U.S. and them, and I think the understanding is that most people, even if they speak the local language, will teach in English, but morality. I wanted to say that I, I gave the, this option in my application to the university and to students and I would say although I can do both, I, I will let you decide what is more beneficial for the students and university. What do you want me to do? Um, most of my, my resources, and you have to remember if you teach, all your teaching resources will be in English and it will be a pain to find any resource in native language. So I think from the very beginning, teaching uh, m reading the material must be in English, right? So students decided that they wanted the lecture and writing and everything in English because they wanted to practice English, they want to hear themselves uh, thinking in English and writing in English, so it depends, I guess. I'll just add to that too. So I mean, when I was in Latvia, there were three other Fulbrighters and I was the only one that spoke Latvian. The rest of them didn't speak a word of the language. They might have learned it as we went on. And one great thing about Fulbright too is they'll actually give you money to study the local language. So yeah, so you can actually get extra money to like hire a private tutor or take classes um, at your university. So any other questions from the audience? Do you guys have any final? Oh, Ken. Gonna make me walk down here. I just walked in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just wondering, guys, have you know? I, I did my sabbatical last year to Ukraine as well, but inspired by Laura. And teaching students, I had to also teach in English. Thank God, because it's the only language I speak. Um, but did you, like me, have need to lower your expectations as far as assignments, material difficulty, and, and all that just because of the second language issue? For me, uh, it, it really depends, like more so in Japan, right? Uh, Germany has a very, very robust English language all the way from kindergarten all the way up. So by the time I got students who were university students, I mean, they were speaking English almost as fluently as I was. Uh, so a lot less there. In Japan, a lot more. Uh, and Japan has a very 
great uh, tiered university system. So my first semester in Japan, I was at one of the national universities, and it was a lot easier to teach and assume some level of understanding. Uh, the schools I taught at in Kyoto, one of them specifically, uh, uh, Kyoto Gaida, Kyoto University of Foreign Studies, was for students who were studying other languages. And so there, it was part of what they were learning. So I had to change that. But also to go to the question, I did have to adjust my teaching expectations, not because of language as much, but because of different university expectations, right? Um, so like in, well in both places, but particularly in Japan, sometimes students are taking like eight classes at once, and the way that the structure is set up is, you know, you go to lecture, and it's, it's like something out of Harry Potter or something like that, right? You go to lecture, and I saw professors do this. They had a prepared talk, they talked for an hour like they were at a conference or something, that was the class, and the students took notes, and then they read things on their own, and then at the end they took an exam. I had to know where the students were coming from and what they were expecting, and in some cases had to do more in-class readings than assign out-class readings, adjust the level of work that they could anticipate between classes, because those weren't how an American university works, it was how a German or a, a Japanese university works. So that was one of the challenges for me, was adjusting to those things. You currently have lectures and then seminars and I learn them on the spot when I go to there. I'm trying to do it here actually, so I thought it worked out nicely. Is that something I can speak on? Well, in Romania they finished their undergrad in three years. So the art history courses are run as a lab. So you have three hours and then another hour. So I was teaching from nine to three. <laughs> so like starting making art with them. At some point you don't so luckily it was amazing, but I'm just saying it's really intense. So I had to adjust, but I felt on the other side, instead of making it lighter, I had to actually go on the heavier side of things. I'll add a quick comment. I, I taught in Portuguese for four months, and I, I wanted that challenge. I wanted to do it. I wanted to practice Portuguese. I had some students that spoke English. Actually, some of them came, kind of came out of the woodwork at the end. And spoke English so well that I, 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 was, I was shocked. Uh, but, but I couldn't have taught in English because only maybe, I don't know, uh, out of 30 students that I had, only maybe maybe five or six spoke English well enough where I could have taught them in English. So I really had to teach in Portuguese. And yes, I had to translate all my syllabi, every document into Portuguese. Uh, I had some colleagues who were I had fantastic colleagues, and they helped me translate those documents. And I translated them, but then they would say, uh, this is maybe a better way to say that. So I, I had a good start. I had studied the language for three years by the time I got there. So in a way, COVID was a blessing because it gave me an extra couple of years to study. I think I would have. Um, that's a terrible thing to say, COVID was a blessing. That, that's not the way I meant it. Scratch that. Um, yeah, for language learning, the extra time gave me gave me an opportunity um, to to improve my language skills. Um, I think I taught one lesson in English once, and it was after I had done a two-hour uh, presentation about uh, music entrepreneurship, and I had to use all these terms in Portuguese that were very complex and and um, jargon, a lot of terminology. My brain was fried at the end of that. So I sat down with one of my students and he said, you know, I speak English. Uh, we can do this in English. For the next two hours I spoke in English, which was very unusual to do. Most of the time I was speaking in Portuguese and doing everything in Portuguese because there were so few English speakers. So, you know, there's a different perspective about teaching the language. I, I could have gone there and taught in English, but it would have been much harder and I would have, had to, I would have needed to translate most of the time. So we're at five o'clock. Do we want to take a five minute break until the next seminar? Okay. So we'll take a five minute break until the faculty uh, led immersion tours. Um, if you're interested in Fulbright, I have some brochures over there. Also, I think you can email all of us and ask us for our applications, ask us to read your um, application. We're happy to share them with you if you're interested. But yeah, thanks so much to everyone who came to this.